Center of the Gary Institute, and I'd like to welcome you tonight uh, to the Dead Aims Lecture. Uh, I want to say a few words both about our speaker and about Dead. Um, I have notes, even though I know both these gentlemen very well, uh, because without those notes, I'm going to miss something. And in fact, with those notes, I'll miss something. Okay. So let me just explain why we have a Dead Aims Lecture for those of you who don't know. Uh, every institution, there, there's an old expression that you know, success has many parents and failure is an orphan. Um, <laughs> the Gary Institute really only has, in, in some ways, uh, two parents. Uh, Dad will disagree with me, but uh, you know, I'm up here tonight. And so uh, I'll take the opportunity. Um, so many, many years ago, uh, in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, uh, the Kerry Arboretum uh, was here. And it was here in part because Ned, as I'm going to get the title, absolutely correct, the manager and trustee of the American Flag and Carry Trust. Uh, when Mrs. Uh, Carrie died, the uh, land was to be preserved uh, in perpetuity uh, for uses consistent with her wishes of keeping it as an open space, and, but also keeping it as, as land that is used for a research and conservation purpose. And initially, the New York Botanical Gardens had this property. Um, there's a little bit of time before that where it was talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Ned is also our historian, so I have to um, but, but after the Arboretum had about a decade of work and, and the, the Pipe Science Building, which was one of the first solar buildings in the country was built, um, there was a desire to make it uh, have higher impact. Um, I will be careful not to use the word impactful because my mother's ghost will come down. Here. <laughs> um, and so then, and some other folks started looking around to try and figure out how to make the science here uh, really world class. And then went and had a conversation with Gene Likens, um, and then had another conversation and another conversation. And after about a year of conversing, uh, Gene moved down here and started the Cary Institute. Uh, Ned, as the manager of the Mary Flagler Cary Trust, was instrumental in not just recruiting Gene, but providing uh, the support that was needed to make this place, uh, if not the world's premier uh, ecosystem science research institute, uh, certainly uh, one of the top two or three. Um, and so Ned is a member of the board of the Cary Institute still. Uh, he and I also happen to sit on the Open Space Institute board, and the Catskill Mountain Keeper board. Ned is on the board of the Wilderness Society. He's the former board chair of the Hudson River Foundation. Um, and in his life, he's founded not just the Cary Institute, or helped um, the Cary Institute, um, but a number of other significant and important organizations, both in the Hudson Valley and further beyond. Um, Ned's role started, uh, I know of it as a program officer at the Ford Foundation, uh, and he really has been instrumental in moving forward the environmental movement. So this lecture honors not just our founding uh, and role, Ned's role in that, but also his tremendous contribution uh, to environmental uh, science and environmental advocacy and the management of open space uh, that makes our world a much nicer place. Very highly contentious, or for some people contentious, the rest of us don't think they're contentious, 
uh, ideas and signs, uh, because Wikipedia can be edited by anybody, can get edited a lot. And after what was it, a decade of going back and changing them back to what they should be, Gene decided to actually do some research. And he and a colleague at the Dartmouth wrote a paper about how contentious science, or science that is socially uh, contentious, uh, even if it's not scientifically contentious, um, gets edited a lot more. And why Wikipedia, perhaps maybe we should tell our children, as I have told mine, uh, is not the authority. <laughs> it's really useful, but it's not the authority. On the other hand, Dr. White is, is the authority. So I will say nothing more than it is a distinct honor to have Gene come and give the Ames lecture. I'm grateful to him, and I'm sure you will be too uh, when he's done. substrate, uh, what's 
So here is bedrock, and this particular area is relatively water tight. So that all the water that comes in in precipitation <coughs> essentially flows out in stream water that we can measure quantitatively. So we can measure the various components of the system quantitatively, and that helps enormously uh, in trying to deal with this complicated system. So if we look at the cover of the book, the upper left-hand uh, photograph on this uh, slide, uh, there are 258 species of vascular plants, there are 27 species of trees, 38 shrubs, 193 herbs, uh, 212 species of macro fungi, those are like the shell fungi you see on the trees, 127 species of birds, six species of salamanders, and a gazillion species of um, microorganisms, bacteria, <coughs> invertebrates in the soil. And then there are all the individuals that make up these species that are all scurrying around within this ecosystem, within this watershed. And our task is to try to make sense uh, out of that complexity. How do you get your head around all that complexity? Well, the diagram on your right is a very simple model. It might not look so simple, but it is a very simple model of how all the system fits together. And our task, starting in 1963, was to try to understand how all of that complexity fit together and what the components of this ecosystem were and put numbers on all of those arrows and boxes. So we can measure the output by putting a, called a uh, gauging weir in the stream, the base of the watershed, and that's what this is. This is actually physically attached to the rock with wing walls that head up along the, the drainage base inside, so all the water is forced to pass through this gauging device at the, at the base. In cleared areas, we measure the amount of precipitation quantitatively. On average, over this five-decade period, we get about 56 inches of precipitation a year. 65% of that turns into stream flow, and 35% evaporates through evapotranspiration to the atmosphere. We measure the, the complexity by getting at what the, the chemistry of the precipitation in stream water or light. We started with a very simple metaphor. Could we, like a physician, use the chemistry of stream water to gauge the health of our complicated ecosystem above that point where the stream water was measured? In the same way that a physician measures the chemistry of blood and urine, if you find something that has gone wrong or is different in the chemistry of your blood and urine, then the physician has to go inside and look at the lungs, the kidneys, the heart, whatever, to try to understand what made the system change. We adopted that metaphor in our approach to this complexity, and actually it worked. We could measure the chemistry, we could see changes over the long term, and we could use that to try to understand what had changed within the ecosystem to make those changes occur. The top panel here is the measure of precipitation nitrate. Nitrate is an important chemical nutrient. You all know that. Use that in your gardens. And the bottom is the nitrate in stream water. So these are long-term records. And if you only had a short segment of that long-term record, you'd be quite confused as to what's going on. But with a long-term record, it's clear that the amount of nitrate in precipitation increased until about the 1980s, 85, 90 or so, and now has decreased. It has actually decreased to levels that are about what they were in 1940 or even 1900. Um, the concentrations have decreased primarily because of our control regulation of emissions of nitrogen uh, oxides to the atmosphere. The stream water bears little relationship to that input. So a lot of things are going on inside the system that is changing it and making it different. We started out with several years that were uh, a lot of, between 0 and 1, these are concentration values, 0 and 1, and then between 1970 and 1980, <coughs> went up to almost 2 on average, and then it dropped down. And currently, 
it's the lowest value we've ever measured in Hubbard Brook, and we're all scratching our heads as to why. We don't really know why it is that low. You'll notice that on the stream water, every one of those years goes up and down in a very regular pattern. It's like a switch. When the buds break in the, in the summertime and the trees come out from the dormancy, the, the nitrate concentration in stream water drops dramatically. And then in the fall when the leaves fall off, the stream water concentration goes up dramatically. And that's what's producing that sawtooth pattern all along. Whether the, the height of those teeth is large or small, it's showing that pattern very regularly year after year after year. I put this one in only because of a regulatory issue. Um, in terms of air pollution, we were dealing with major particulate air pollution in the 70s in places like Pittsburgh or Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, or Fort Wayne, Indiana. Air pollution particulate matter was really very bad. It was largely because of the combustion of coal that was putting out a lot of soot, if you will, and that soot contained calcium and magnesium. So calcium and magnesium are not only important plant nutrients, but they were important in terms of the air pollution story that I'm going to get to in a moment. Our long-term records show that from the beginning, from 1963 until about 1975 or 1980 for stream water, there was a sharp decline, and then since that time, there's been either no decline, it's been steady, or it's a slow decline. We pushed very hard for the development of national air quality and precipitation quality networks across the United States. We were successful. They started in 1978 or 1980. You see, unfortunately, all the action was over. So the value of long-term records becomes very clear. Without that long-term nature, you miss all the action that had occurred uh, prior to that time because of air pollution control uh, on those emissions. Uh, this is, um, I, each one of these um, vignettes uh, could take an hour, but I told you I have a minute for you. Um, this is something that is currently appeared that has us all very much interested and puzzled about. In both precipitation and stream water, the concentrations are headed toward distilled water. And you can see on, the, on this graph, I'll point it out, on this graph, zero line would be distilled water, demineralized water. And these lines are very robust. You don't need statistics to show you that it's heading toward those lines. They're going down very, very steeply toward those lines. And this is largely due to the effect of air pollution control. Air pollution control is good in terms of trying to clean up the environment. But in this case, in this environment, it has overshot the value that we would like to have. So we really can't have distilled water in our streams and lakes. That's not, that's not possible. So we theoretically calculated that it has to bend over here somewhere. This is a plot of the total electrical conductivity of the water. That's all the electrical solutes in the water. So it's a good measure of everything chemically in the water. So we're estimating that it should bend over somewhere here because it really can't go to the still water. Just can't. Well, look at the last four points in terms of precipitation. One, two, three, four points. It looks like maybe it's starting to bend over already. And we're very excited to follow that. For me, um, every year is an exciting new number. I want to know what next year is going to be like, and this is no uh, exception. One of the things that we've done in Hubbard Drug was to experimentally manipulate whole watershed ecosystems. They're my test tubes. I use them to experimentally manipulate because uh, experimentation is so powerful tool in science. The first experiment we did was we deforested the entire watershed. We didn't hole away the logs, we just cut
cut down all the trees, left them in place. We knew that this should increase the amount of water leaving the system because normally the water uh, that falls in rain and snow, uh, a lot of that is transpired away by the vegetation. In fact, about 70% of it is transpired by the plants in this forest. Well, when we cut all those trees, then that water that normally would be going off as water vapor now had to come out as liquid water in the stream. What we didn't expect, however, was that there would be a chemical change. Incidentally, I love this graph because uh, this was made back in the time when you took a photograph of a, of a graph that you made and then you did a negative uh, and you covered in the negative with shell mark and pen and then you put it in a holder and you could show it. Um, it took me longer to make an electronic version of this graph than it did to make the original graph. At any rate, so we cut the forest in the winter, December and January of 1965, 66. Not much happened until the following summer. And then the nitrate, again nitrate, using that as my example, shot up dramatically, shot up to values that were higher than the public health service allowed in drinking water. Here was good, clean water, ha uh ha, -huh, draining out of this forest that was no longer portable because it, we had cut down the trees. It declined the next uh, winter, and then the second summer came to a value almost twice the value for uh, drinking. This was a total surprise. We didn't expect this, nor did anybody. It caused a lot of uh, concern nationally because uh, clear cutting was the way in which timber was harvested in both the East Coast and the West Coast. And here was an idea that there might be something uh, uh, wrong or, or unusual about the effects that nobody had thought about. Uh, so this caused a big stir. The effects, and I don't have time to go through this in great detail, but so this is clear cutting. Clear cutting of the forest, in this case, would be all the way the logs, but it reduced the transpiration because the trees were killed, as I said. It also increased the amount of nutrients because of microbial reactions that were occurring in the soil, and the uptake of nutrients wasn't possible because the trees were gone. And all that led to larger amounts of dissolved substances in soil solution, more water, and so the export was greatly increasing in terms of nitrate. Well, as I said, this caused great concern and uh, led us to then work very hard to try to figure out ways in which clear cutting could occur, but to minimize the damage. And one of the uh, features was that was we proposed that no area, no block, no site should be cut more often than once every 75 years. In fact, the Forest Service has now adopted that policy and gone one better and no site is to be cut more often than once every 100 years. Um, the effect of the, the occurrence of um, clear cutting in the Northeast now has declined dramatically, but with all the uh, increased demand for wood pellets, I don't know, we may see it come back, we'll see. So we've done a lot of these experimental manipulations within this experimental forest. We've done this uh, experiment that I described very briefly. We've done one which was horizontal strips here and a number of, of uh, different kinds of cuttings. And I'm going to show you this slide and don't scream, but I'm showing it to you because I want you to see how complicated uh, the results are. Each point on this graph is a volume weighted annual uh, nitrate uh, concentration and what it shows is that when we cut these different watersheds side by side with different procedures and at different times, they produce different results. There are legacies. Think back about my metaphor with the physician. If you had your kidney removed, there's a legacy of that action is going to affect what happens to you the next time you take in some toxic substance. 
Same thing it turns out here. There's a legacy. So there's one watershed here in green that when we had uh, excessive soil frost and a big ice storm and more soil frost, it didn't even bother to respond. Right down here, it didn't do anything. But the others did. They all responded and on and on. So I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but just to emphasize how complex and difficult it is dealing with my test tubes, which are side by side, that aren't exactly the same because they're living body units. We also looked uh, extensively at streams, and um, we experimentally manipulated streams. It was thought by many engineers and scientists that streams were just Teflon channels or Teflon pipes, and the water just flowed out and it wasn't affected by streams. Well, that certainly is the truth. We tested all kinds of things. We added nitrogen, we added uh, phosphorus, we added acid, we added uh, all kinds of things to the systems. We manipulated them in a variety of ways. And what we learned was that, no, those systems are ecosystems. They function like ecosystems. They respond, and they're integral parts of the whole landscape, which the landscape doesn't function without their added function to it. This is just an example of, of doing one experiment on manipulation to a screen. The forest is uh, quite diverse. Um, the diversity of uh, birds, and trees, and insects, and microorganisms is uh, very great, uh, beautiful. Um, one of the charismatic parts of the study is being able to, I always said, uh, I can't believe somebody pays me to work at Hubbard Brook uh, all these years. It's a beautiful place in the White Mountains. Uh, but I've always felt that way. Uh, spring flowers, uh, trilliums, and, and uh, trout lilies, and on and on. We had to try to put all this together. Uh, we had to try to understand who ate who, and when, and how much. And again, this is an hour's lecture that I'm not going to give you. But it's just an example of we have uh, fungi and bacteria in the soils, and we have invertebrates in the soils, and we have the plants and all the parts that they have, and then we have all the animals that eat the plants and the fungi, and then we have the animals that eat these animals, and so forth. And we put numbers on every one of those interactions. It took us a long time to do that, but it was absolutely crucial if we were to try to understand how this system Function, how it worked, and be able to then manage it or provide management information. One of the outcomes of this, um, uh, my colleague Dick Holmes led a study uh, uh, starting in 1969 on the bird abundances at Hubbard Brook. And what they found is that currently the bird populations at Hubbard Brook, all species combined, are about 70% less than they were in the uh, early 1970s uh, when they started to work. Why? We also learned that the salamander populations are down about 70% from where they were in the late 1960s, early 1970s, with long-term censuses on these uh, two groups some birds decrease, like the American Red Star. In fact, the flycatcher and the wood thrush have disappeared from Hubbard Brook. They were there abundantly, and they're now gone. Others, like the red-eyed vireo, really hasn't changed much. The black-throated green warbler is an example of one that has actually increased. So within that overall decline, which is large and significant, there are individual species that do different things. So the bird group, as we call them, uh, set about trying to understand why this is so. They've been doing work at Hubbard Brook in the summertime, um, observing <coughs> reproduction, uh, nest fledglings, nesting and fledglings, um, 
mortality, all the things you have to do to try to understand the population of those birds. Uh, but these are all, uh, these main birds I'm talking about, are all forms that migrate. They migrate to the Caribbean, uh, Central America, Northern and South America, and they do so every year. These are little bitty birds that make that long journey every year. So it became clear to them that they couldn't really understand how these bird populations were functioning without looking at their wintering grounds. They weren't going to the, <coughs> to the tropics on vacation. <coughs> Excuse me, they were going there to survive. So they, they set up studies in Jamaica to try to understand what these birds were doing during the winter period. And again, that's a long, detailed story. But the, the end result is that most of the mortality occurs in the migration periods, when they're flying from Hubbardbrook, New Hampshire, to Jamaica or, or someplace in, else in the Caribbean or Central America, or when they're flying back. One red star, they, they banned it. They found nine years consecutively had made that round trip. I think that's an amazing uh, little factoid. Um, so when the birds were and are at Hubbard Brook in the summertime, uh, they have relatively little mortality uh, adults. Uh, so about 1%. And in the winter, they found they have relatively little mortality, about maybe 7%. But in the migration times, both coming and going, uh, their mortality is in the order of 30 to 35%. So that's when most of the mortality uh, occurs. And there are carryover effects. If their wintering habitat has been degraded, particularly with relative to food, then that's going to affect the mortality in their migration back to Hubbard Brook and vice versa. <coughs> So being able to work that out, and the first time this has ever been worked out for a migratory bird, um, was a major discovery that, that came from these long-term work at Hubbard Brook. Some of you think that chipmunks are very cute. Uh, some of you uh, like birds. Well, chipmunks and red squirrels are big predators on bird nests. And here's one caught in the act. This is a chipmunk. Um, Cameras are used in the summertime to look at this predation. And so this chipmunk was having a nice dinner of, of these uh, young birds <coughs> in the nest. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest mortality uh, at Hubbard Brook on birds in the summertime uh, in terms of reproduction is nest predators. All kinds of nest predators have been observed. Uh, pine marten, a black bear, um, uh, blue jays, but the big, the big predators are um, the squirrels and the chipmunks. Okay, we discovered acid in uh, North America at Hubbard Brook. The very first sample of rain that we collected on 24 July 1963 had a pH about 100 times more acid than we thought it should be. We actually didn't know how acid it should be. But we thought uh, this was way too acid, and about 100 times more acid than it should be. Um, we uh, didn't publish our first paper on acid rain until um, well, the discovery of 63, until 1972. So nine years later, it took us to work out the details of where it had come from, was it unusual? How long had it been acid? Uh, how did it get that way? It took us that long to, to get that kind of an answer. And as Josh mentioned, uh, we didn't call that first paper just acid rain. I think we argued a lot about that. And uh, I was a senior author of the paper, and I argued strongly that I thought it should be acid rain. And I didn't have any idea really then how much impact just that phrase might be, but in talking about 
singing in the rain, walking in the rain, washing your hair in the rain, and then saying, yeah, but the rain isn't really very good. Maybe you don't want to do that. I gave a talk once at the University of California at Davis. Uh, it was a scientific talk. There must have been a reporter in the audience. Next morning, the Sacramento Bee, which is the main newspaper in Sacramento, where Davis is, had a headline, Cop says rain on acid trip. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I would like to think of myself as a conservative uh, scientist, but sometimes to get the attention of the public, you do have to uh, use words that uh, capture their attention. Um, it wasn't until I changed jobs. I was a professor at Dartmouth and I moved to Cornell. And I set up uh, rain collection sites all around the Finger Lakes. And I found that uh, the pH, this is a, a graph of the pH at both Hubbard Brook and two sites in the Finger Lakes were exactly the same. And that was the first clue that we had that this might be a regional problem. We didn't know that. Before, you know, maybe it was just some unusual thing in the White Mountains of New Hampshire at Hubbard Brook. Um, we published a paper on that regional last time in the journal Science uh, in 1974. The paper was picked up on the New York Times and they featured it on the front page of the New York Times in June. And my life has never been the same since. Um, the, uh, <coughs> the regional aspect became clearer. Um, we had to uh, answer all kinds of questions like how long has it been this way? We set up monitoring stations in several of the most remote places on the planet that we could find. The southern tip of Chile, the southern tip of South Africa, an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, a remote place in Australia, Catherine, a remote place in China, and we ran collections there for up to 10 years at each of those sites just to answer the question, what is it likely been the pH of rain before human influence? And it was indeed about 100 times less acid than that first sample we collected at Hubbard Brook. As you all know, the wind tends to blow from west to east, and most of the um, affluence from the burning of coal and oil, which is the source of acid rain, uh, come from uh, the electrical utilities in the Midwest. 70% of the sulfur dioxide comes from electric utilities in the Midwest. So as the, those pollutants come up and are carried to the, the east, the northeast, and fall back to the land as acidified rain and snow, sleet, and hail, um, that's where the problem uh, came from. Well, that led then to what I call the acid rain wars of the 1980s. Uh, there was this huge copper nickel smelter in Sudbury, uh, Ontario, at a super stack 380 meters tall. And out of this stack came more sulfur dioxide than all of the active volcanoes together throughout the entire world. A huge source of sulfur. You can see the plume from the stack, but the Canadians argued that most of their sulfur was coming from us in the U.S., not from places like this in Canada. So President Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, uh, um, started a, an effort to develop a brand, memorandum of intent between Canada and the U.S. But one of the first things that Ronald Reagan did when he was elected was to shelve that memorandum of intent. And literally, it was a very, very large shelf of materials I actually helped working on. So this is a cartoon. I'm going to come back to cartoons in a moment. Uh, I think you can read it. Sir, all Canadians pray for a solution to the aspirin problem. Uh, well, gosh, Brian, you tell them that Nancy and I joined them in their prayers. And so that didn't happen. And instead, we decided to study the problem for 10 years. I was asked to lead a small delegation uh, to the White House. Um, it was the president and the full uh, 
uh, cabinet. We had a, an hour with him telling him about acid rain and what we thought could be done to uh, alleviate the problem. And two little quick stories. Um, some of you have heard this, these stories before, but at the end, President Reagan sat back in his chair and he said to me, quote, well, it's clear to me that my undergraduate education didn't prepare me for such complicated issues as this, unquote. And I thought, good grief. Um, <laughs> um, and so, the other little story is, some of you in this room are old enough to remember the apothecary jar of jelly beans. Right there. Well, it wasn't a figment of somebody's imagination, it was there. And so he offered us all uh, a jelly bean. Uh, and I reached in with my hand and I grabbed a handful of them. And I put them in my pocket. Uh, they made wonderful gifts. Um, <laughs> my, my mother thought it was the best gift I ever gave her. She was a lot of jelly bean from President Reagan. <laughs> so, 50 years later, here's the long term record of acid rain at Hubbard Brook, starting here, and here's where we are currently. Uh, this is the 1970 Clean Air Act, the 1998 Clean Air Act amendments. Uh, this was the first uh, uh, political action that specifically addressed acid rain. So we've come from the discovery to an action, a, a regulatory action. Uh, you can see the downward trend, but it took us 18 years of continuous measurement in order to statistically show that the rain was becoming less acid. 18 years. If you take any one of those shorter periods, uh, they, don't, they don't tell you what is really going on. So the rain falls on the floor, it falls on the soil, and it leaches out uh, calcium, magnesium, and aluminum. And we calculated that about 50 kilograms of calcium per hectare were deleted from soils at Hubbard Brook during 1940 to 1955. And we also were observing that the forest had stopped growing. The forest had been cut there heavily between 1910 and 1920. And so when we first started our study, this was the biomass of the forest. And it was increasing as we expected. We actually expected it to continue to increase. But it didn't. It flattened. And then it started to decline. And actually became significantly less here. At the same time, there was increased mortality uh, within the system, particularly in sugar maple. So we developed another experiment, and this was to add back all the calcium and more that we thought had been leached by acid rain uh, experimentally. So we went to uh, a place in the Adirondack Mountains and mined a mineral called the last night we did mine it. We had a mine at a ground to a fine powder and then pelletized so that we could handle it. And then my helicopter was added back to an entire watershed ecosystem to see if that would um, reverse the trends that we're seeing. And in fact, it did. And so catching the end of that graph, which was showing the decline in the, the forest biomass in Humber Brook, this is the effect of the treated watershed. So adding that calcium silicate mineral increased uh, the growth uh, of the forest and, and reversed that trend that we were seeing. Uh, with lead spruce, lead spruce has injury caused by acid rain. The, the acid rain leaches calcium out of the needles and makes them more sensitive to winter injury. And it looks like this. And the and, and effect of adding this calcium silicate mineral, the, uh, the set of winter injury is much less than it was in the uh, untreated reference. So uh, it has an effect. So the difference of acid green on, on different trees is important. This is one of the things that we and many others uh, learn. And, uh, and when I'm saying we, I should say this is a, there's some 1,500 papers that have been produced 
uh, the work at Hubbard Brook and dozens of scientists. So this is really the, the royal we when I say that. Uh, but with uh, conifers like uh, red spruce, red spruce in particular, as I've already said, uh, that's what causes the damage. Plus this aluminum that is leached out of the soil. Aluminum in solid form is not toxic, but in dissolved form is very toxic. So the sugar maple, the calcium and magnesium reach from the soil, which are nutrients. The aluminum affects uh, the tree because it's toxic. And so the effect is different. Some of you probably have sugar maples that look just like this in your lawn or if you're along the roadside. Many of you visited, um, by chance, the, the Storrs Campus University of Connecticut. There's some beautiful sugar maples there, and they almost all look like this. They've gone to great efforts to cut out this dead leader and try to make them not look so bad. But it's an acid rain effect. It's an effect of, uh, uh, of this sort, of those beautiful trees. So it takes a long time. We needed those basic answers uh, in order to uh, come to a point where some resolution could be made. I say it took three U.S. presidents and one pope in 27 years. Uh, one pope because um, I and some others met the Vatican for a week. Uh, talking about this problem, we gave uh, the pope, Pope John Paul II, our results. Um, he listened very carefully and issued an encyclical. So I'm very convinced that that encyclical has a lot of impact in terms of resolving this problem. But the problem does continue, and because of all the leaching of calcium and magnesium, all the buffering capacity out of the soil, the soils are now more sensitive uh, than they were before. Uh, some of you hear arguments about, well, yeah, but all this costs too much. Well, EPA did a cost-benefit analysis on air pollution acid rain, and they estimated the cost uh, 2003, which is pertinent to the major time when acid rain was so prevalent, over the previous 10 years were eight to almost nine billion dollars per year for the benefits. They calculated between 101 and 119 billion dollars. So uh, there's numbers generated by uh, EPA. Well, how do we communicate this to the public and policymakers? Um, there's been some recent studies that have tried to look at this carefully, and one of the things that they found is that maps and charts are really very effective. So we would show maps of the extent of acid rain in 1965, and then 1975, and then 1985. And those were very effective at pointing out how this problem was getting larger in scope and, and worse. And I already showed you one cartoon, but there was a whole series of cartoons. I'm a big fan of cartoons, and right now the political cartoons are playing their role. Um, but here's one. It says, acid rain shower got to it before I could. It shows the skeleton of a fish. Well, it's clearly not correct. Acid rain wouldn't dissolve the meat away and leave the bones. If anything, it would dissolve the bones and leave the meat. Um, but it isn't doing either one. It's best strong in acid. But, but the, uh, the point is that this cartoon has a really strong message. And the fish that were being killed, particularly in links in the Adirondacks and other places like that, uh, really got the public uh, concerned and led to President uh, Bush Sr. signing into law the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments to try to resolve the problem. Uh, it's really rare, uh, and I have some pride, I guess, about this, that a scientist will live long enough to discover a problem and be around to see it resolved or, or treated uh, in this way. And unfortunately, on the first slide I showed you with my four colleagues that started on the brook, um, three of them have died, and I'm the only one left. Um, and I was able to stick around long enough to see uh, the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments 27 years later. Very quickly, some points about uh, climate change. Uh, my lesson important, air temperatures increasing, winter and summer, soil temperatures increasing, getting wetter, uh, 
there's not a snow depth that's decreasing. We're now getting much more rain and sleet in the wintertime and less snow. And the days of ice cover, I'll show you that in more detail. So ice cover on the lake is a really good measure of the total heat budget effect. So when the ice comes on the lake and when it melts off in the springtime, that period of ice cover, whether it's longer or shorter, is a good measure of what's happening in, in warming. So the ice cover of Mirror Lake, this lake at the bottom of the valley, has declined in this matter until the current time. It's now 24 days shorter ice cover than it was in the 60s when we started our movement. 24 days shorter. That has all kinds of impacts on the lake that I don't have time to talk about. This year was the shortest ever. It was only 81 days long. The ice on was the latest ever, and the ice off was the earliest ever. So that point is way out. Look, look at this graph with, bear with me for just a moment. The long-term record, okay, it's pretty clear it's, it's trending downward. But from about here on, look how much variability we have. We didn't have that here. Much more regular. And then we started looking at this swinging back and forth. This is exactly what the climate scientists tell us uh, should be happening in terms of variability. So these major lessons learned. Um, this is what we set out to try to do. We accomplished a lot of them. Um, some of the uh, results led to um, major actions like acid rain. But all of the results have some kind of management information, and we try to, to pursue that as much as possible. I want to finish with uh, <coughs> a personal note. Um, when Nick Holmes and I were writing this book, and we wrote it together, we didn't it wasn't one person wrote it, the other person read it and made comments. We wrote it together. Um, uh, I was, uh, uh, my wife was dying of ALS and I was uh, caring for her and I needed some time away and so I went for a walk. I got a nurse from the Yukon, uh, nursing school to come and sit with her while I was gone. And while I was walking, I had this thought that the book really needed something more personal in it. We wrote the book to be accessible to the interested lay person as well as scientists. We wanted to try to take out all the jargon and we wanted it to be understandable. But I thought it needed something more personal. So the prologue, as I was walking, I said, why don't we write something about what it's like to step into the forest and let your senses take over. Your eyes, your ears, your nose, your skin. Let that tell you what is going on in the forest. So as I walked, I wrote that in my head. And I came back and I put it down and uh, I shared it with Dick Holmes and he liked it. So it's, it's the prologue the book. And then we thought, well, uh, if we have what it's like to walk into the forest today, what's it going to be like to walk into the forest in 2065, 50 years later? We've worked for 50 years, what's it going to be like 50 years later? So we wrote an epilogue, which is like that. It's walking into the forest in 2065. Uh, I'm fairly conservative, or I said that once tonight. Nick is even more conservative. So I don't think we went as far as we should have, could have, with our projections. But one of the things we put in there is that all the sugar maples are gone at Hubbard Brook. Uh, that's possible. Um, but that the Forest Service had planted a patch of uh, GMO uh, sugar maples. <laughs> and the rumor has it that the maple syrup, the old sugar maples, isn't nearly as good as it used to be. <laughs> um, we have drones collecting data and whatnot. But, you know, it, it, how, we, how we make decisions as a country in terms of our environmental actions and, uh, and the legacies that we leave, 
will determine what that epilogue is like, whether it really is not too nice, or if it's going to be OK. And we're the only ones that can determine how that will turn out. Um, <laughs> this was our 25th anniversary. Uh, Borman, me, and Bob Pierce. Um, Noah Johnson had already died by then. Uh, we, uh, we were having fun. And the point that I would make is that we've got to have fun. Uh, I couldn't have stayed with this project for 53 years if I wasn't having fun. I never think of a day getting up dreading to go to work because I love what I do. And it keeps me going and allows me to keep at with these long-term uh, records. Uh, these are some of the people that have been with me for a very long time and many, many more. Um, but thanks for listening. Yes. 
Um, I don't know about the ocean, but uh, but um, as we have more and more rain, um, that it's getting wetter than it is, that's how we brought it for sure, uh, then that serves as a dilution effect uh, on the pollutants or in the atmosphere. Um, if it's raining more often, that can scrub more pollutants out of the atmosphere at the time that that's occurring. Uh, so there are lots of interactions that occur. And a lot of those haven't been worked out carefully at all. What about glyphosate and all of the herbicides? Um, we haven't studied herbicides. Uh, we did use herbicides in that first experimental deforestation because we wanted to prevent any regrowth of the vegetation. We did that for three years. Uh, but we haven't, we haven't done experimental treatment with herbicides. We think of the White Mountains as being pristine. Right. Are there correlations with our area? Oh, yeah. Is sure. it exponential in terms of? The differences or the, is it, are the effects reversible? You know, it, you've got so much so well, so yeah. Um, well, there, there, there are all kinds of uh, interconnections. I mean, uh, we're in a uh, North Hollywood forest here, uh, the same way. Uh, there are more oaks here, there are more uh, pines here than there are in the area where I work in North Brook. But, um, <coughs> The evolution, there have been many studies that have been done here at the Institute. There's a monitoring station at the Institute, a long-term monitoring station. And I noticed that there's a poster in the hall of the Mass Science Building that summarizes some of the things that are being measured and some of the findings that are occurring. Uh, so there's a long-term record now here as well. But um, there are many connections and there are many differences. But, a lot more people here than there, and that's a big part. So maybe time for one more question. Uh, did you, we see this uh, intense criticism and, and uh, worse of scientists working on climate down. Uh, did you endure that kind of uh, pressure? <laughs> from absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, <coughs> it was uh, different. The, the problem of less rain and climate change are different in terms of scope. Um, acid rain occurs all around the world, but there's places only where the soils are sensitive, a uh, low, low buffering capacity where the effects are large, whereas climate change occurs all around the world, so the, the scope is different. Absolutely, yes. Um, one last story, and I finished with one last story. I had a contract put out on me. Not, not on my life, but on my career. Um, a uh, company uh, offered $400,000, and this was back, this must have been about 1981 or so, maybe 82. So it was a lot of money then, uh, it was still. Um, and the contract said, this was a call for proposals, but Likens has said, one, two, three, four things, five, six, that I said in print show that he is wrong. One of the, the I'd say the crowning points of my career is they weren't able to do it. <laughs> Line between applied and pure and 
and science and management. And I think it's one of the remarkable things about this institution is everyone here pursues their science for love and passion and interest. But that line between theory and applied science is really quite thoroughly blurred and non-existent. And again, I think we owe Gina a debt of thanks for that uh, as an institution. So thank you, sir. Thank <laughs> you.